Welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. I'm your host as always, Marcus Sadu, and today we are chatting with Dr. Mike Isertel. I've been following Mike's work for a long time now. He's a super smart dude. He's got a really clear and concise way of illustrating points, and we're going to be chatting about the trade-offs that are to be made between health performance and body composition because there are trade-offs at the top end when trying to optimize for any one of those three. Now before we dig into the episode, if you're interested in personalized one-on-one nutritional coaching or workout programming with me, you can check out the website at n1fitness.com forward slash coaching to book a consultation and that link is linked below in the show notes and let's get into the interview with Mike. I hope you enjoy it. Mike Isertel, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me on. So before we dig into our topic today, can you give folks a little bit of background on yourself and how you got into all this fitness stuff to begin with? Yeah, it was actually uh, designed by aliens to come to Earth (laughs) and deliver fitness information. They they did an okay job. That was an older model. There's better ones out there. Um, But uh, on a serious note... I um, originally uh, so did my PhD in uh, sports physiology, which is the study of sort of nutrition, training, recovery of athletes. And then uh, when I began to be a professor of exercise and sports science, um, and I was a professor for four years, I started to teach a whole lot of courses on not just athlete stuff, but um, uh, just healthy people stuff. And uh, a lot of the course material that I was given – and the text that I had to go off of were good but not great. We ended up investing a lot of time and, and energy into figuring the stuff out a little better, figuring out how to communicate it a little better, and getting some insights of our own and uh, some of the data analysis we've done at my company, RP. And then we ended up uh, developing a whole lot of materials, books and lectures and so on and so forth, um, and actually digital products for people that weren't exactly athletes but were just folks who were trying to get in shape and, and really – folks that were trying to make sense of all the contradictory claims out there about what's going to get you in shape and what's going to be good for your health because there's so much stuff out there that just you know can't all be true. For example, you know, uh, vegans will tell you that their diet is the healthiest and carnivore diet adherents will tell you that their diet cured a bunch of diseases. Uh, you know, there's just got to be some, some light between those two. And so uh, we've sort of developed a couple of pieces of understanding and I've been uh, lecturing about that at the university level. I've been lecturing about it abroad on seminars and doing videos and conferences and stuff like that, putting out books. So hopefully I know something or other about how to sort of get healthier, maintain health, and so on and so forth. Awesome, man. Awesome. So today we're going to be talking about the differences between eating for health performance and body comp because while there's a bunch of crossover between the three, when we're optimizing for any one of them, there are trade-offs to be made in the other areas. So I think it might be helpful for folks to think about the concept sort of like a Venn diagram. So there's going to be a whole bunch of similarities between the three goals. However, on the fringes, there are going to be these definitive differences. So first off, Mike, can you outline for folks what the performance, health, and body composition goals would all have in common when it comes to nutrition, and then we can get into what differs between them. Yeah. The general categories of nutrition that you're going to look at are going to be the same. So you're going to look at uh, the amount of food you're eating, uh, calories basically. You don't have to count them, but we can get into that later. How much food you're eating, uh, what the composition of that food is, Uh, as in uh, macronutrient-wise, so how much of it is protein, how much is carbohydrate, how much is fat. You're going to be concerned with timing to some extent, like do we eat like one big meal a day or six small meals, how far should meals be spread, should we be eating more carbs before workouts or something, or same. And you're also going to be concerned with uh, food composition as far as when you zoom in on that, we're eating some amount of proteins, carbs, and fats. Where are we actually getting those foods? Like, are you getting your proteins from shakes, or are they coming from lean meats, or are they coming from vegan products? Are your carbohydrates just Gatorade powder, or are they fresh fruits and vegetables? Because that seems to have an effect uh, some, to some extent. Uh, and then, of course, uh, after that, you are left with sort of supplements and hydration. You know, uh, are you hydrating properly, and to what extent? And what kind of supplements are you taking to support potential health and fitness, and so on and so forth. So all of those general categories are the same. Uh, and then... 
the degree to which they are important depends on if your goal is body composition slash performance, which are very similar intersections, um, and health, which is a little bit different. Uh, I will say that the big commonalities for eating for health and for body composition and performance are that, first of all, calories are always king for all of them. How much food you eat is number one. Number two, uh, for all of them, supplements do very, very little. It does not to say that they don't do anything, but they're just very, very underpowered, a very tiny fraction. So calories are king. Supplements are dead last. Hydration makes a small difference for both, uh, as long as you don't really mess it up. And then for all of them, nutrient timing is a significant factor, but a very small factor. Still more relevant than supplements, but just not a huge deal. So it's sort of automatically going to tell us that if a diet being offered by us uh, to us by someone is really, really big on timing, it's probably big on something that doesn't matter a whole lot. Right? And then where there are differences, and we can get into this in just a sec, is uh, the degree to which it's important to eat certain amounts of macros, like proteins versus carbs versus fats, and the degree to which the body uh, or the food composition, where those sources come from, matter. Because for diet and health, for diet and performance and body composition, those two actually flip flop to some extent. So, you know, if you're eating the right amount of food and you're making sure to time your meal sensibly and you're not putting too much of a premium on supplements, you're going to be performing at a high level and to be very healthy, so on and so forth. But if you want to shift to either a little bit more to performance, a little bit more to health, you're going to have to choose uh, which way you prioritize the macros versus the composition of those macros. Now, when it comes to total calories, so first and foremost, total calories, how does that, how do total calories, uh, total amount of food intake differ between individuals that are after health performance or body composition? Yeah. So the first thing to say is that individuals that are after performance are going to be burning usually more calories per day than individuals not after performance because they're going to be training for performance, which means you usually perform a lot and thus you need more calories. So sometimes you can look at an individual who weighs maybe, let's say, 150 pounds when they're an endurance athlete and they consume like four or 5,000 calories a day. And you're like, oh my God, that, 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 quote, that can't be healthy. Well, it's actually just completely healthy for them because they are not gaining weight at that level of calories because they burn so much weight off. And you can see endurance athletes go through mounds of pasta and just sit there and be like, oh my God, like what, what in God's name is going on here? You know, like this is just baffling stuff. That can't be healthy, but it turns out in the in balance it is. So big, big thing about performance and calories is making sure to get enough calories you need to fuel your training. Big thing about calories and health is to get enough calories to keep you at a healthy body weight. Sometimes for some kinds of performance, having a high level of performance means you are not at a healthy weight. For example, if you're a strong man or strong woman competitor, to a, a large extent, the bigger you can be, the better. Weighing 400 pounds is not good for your health excellent for your performance. So at some point, you might have to make a trade-off. For most people, the trade-off isn't very large because if you want to be a great CrossFitter, you're still in a very healthy weight range. But if you're in powerlifting, bodybuilding, strongman, so on and so forth, you may find that gaining a, a quite a bit of weight, including muscle, is not optimal for your health. While for health, the calorie balance should be one that keeps you in a healthy weight range, and each height for both males and females has its own healthy weight ranges. This is in, described in our book, Understanding Healthy Eating by, by Renaissance Periodization. Uh, just generally speaking, it's somebody of a sort of smaller to normal body size. Uh, and to a certain degree, the smaller you are, the healthier you can be. And that, that does not go in infinitely because if you get too far underweight, you're all of a sudden going to be sick more and more likely to be in poor and poor health. But uh, smaller people generally live longer and are healthier than larger people. So those healthy weight ranges tend to not go super high. Uh, to put that in perspective, I currently weigh roughly 240 pounds at five foot six. I'm like, oh, a good 60 pounds off from the top end of the healthy weight range for my height. And fucking so, jacked. <laughs> yeah, cer certainly can perform, but uh, it's a known trade-off. So that's where the calories kind of split apart. Uh, so, you know, both folks need to attend, the calories need to be to their goal, but generally speaking, the performance goal is, to, you know, determined by how heavy do you want to be slash how much calorie uh, burning do you do, whereas for health, it's, uh, you know, to a certain extent, the smaller the better. And, and thus, the fewer calories, the better. Talking about the person that is after performance and eating, say, four to 5,000 calories a day to fuel all of that movement, 
uh, even though they're a small individual. What would you say around potential like mitochondrial health and just sort of wearing out the cellular structures uh, with all the throughput of the food and then the activity around um, just that much performance and that much training volume? Mm -hmm. It's definitely an an issue and it probably reduces longevity while increasing the quality of life during the time that you're alive. So it's a bit of a trade-off there. Like, you know, if you're a marathon runner, you're going to be super healthy and super in great shape for your entire life. But you might, you know, get the, the big heart attack when you're 85 versus if you try to do less physical activity and get even smaller and less, eat even fewer calories, you might live until you're 90 or 95. But, you know, you're not exactly going to be impressing anybody when you're older and you might actually not even be that independent um, and, and that strong. You know, you potentially be weaker and sort of not being able to lift heavy objects. You're certainly not going to have like a a reserve of energy, a reserve of muscularity and strength, but you live, live a long time. Uh, so the, the, the energy throughput and cellular degradation is definitely a factor with hard training. I will say it's not a very big factor relative to other factors. For example, if you just have a sedentary lifestyle and have no activity, <coughs> that kills you, excuse me, <coughs> speaking of which, I'm sitting down and dying, um, <laughs> that, uh, that kills you way faster than uh, having even a very high level of exercise. And eating very unhealthy foods, being overweight and over fat, cigarette smoke, so on and so forth, that kills you way faster, like way, 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 way worse for you. So, you know, we can certainly say that the people who are involved in really high throughput energy activities are reducing their lifespan to some very small extent, maybe at the top end, five years, 10 years at most. People who are involved in a sedentary lifestyle concomitantly with poor diet and uh, obesity they're reducing their lifespan by 20 to 40 years, <laughs> right? Way different. And also the morbidity aspect. So the quality of life of someone who trains, quote unquote, too much is going to be amazing until they just drop dead at some point um, or so, you know, fall apart in the last several years of their life and then drop dead. Somebody who's over fat, has diabetes, et cetera, so on and so forth, the, you know, uh, especially as medical technology has improved in our current development of civilization to the sort of intermediate state where medical technology can keep your ass alive much longer than you're supposed to be alive. But that's not a whole lot of fun. And what we end up seeing is an extension of longevity with a concomitant extension of the morbidity. So you just kind of like in really shitty health from age 50 to age 75. And like normally you would die at age 55, but you had a heart attack. You were close enough to a hospital. They sort of fixed your ass up a little bit. Now you're walking around sort of half dead for another 20 years. Uh, and you're not allowed to exercise very rigorously and you're sort of still eating like crap and you can't move around and, you know, you have to have a machine to help you sleep because uh, it breathes for you and so on and so on. And it's just, uh, you know, you're on 50 billion medications. You might be doing dialysis. So uh, I, I think every now and again people see some research or some insight that, oh, you know, training super hard for endurance is going to reduce longevity. And they're like, see, this, this is why I'm, I don't exercise. And it's like, no, 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 no. You're on the way opposite end of that spectrum and on the much, much worse end. So, so that probably has to be said. Yeah, man, that's a great point. Now, next up, we've got macronutrients, so protein, carbs, and fats. What are the variances between our three goals when it comes to macronutrient breakdowns? Yeah, it's actually quite easy to, to explain and understand. The, um, for performance and body composition, macronutrient amounts are pretty specific, and uh, they're sort of specific to the task at hand. For example, if you are trying to eat uh, in such a way as to increase your muscularity, the amount of protein you take in has to be at least a minimum amount and probably a pretty stable amount. Um, and the more, the better, up to a certain amount. And so you're in this pretty tight range of protein, in which, like, unless you eat that minimum for sure, then you're definitely sort of throwing off uh, potential benefits. In addition, your energy expenditure and training and a variety of other anabolic uh, pathways are maximized by carbohydrate consumption, at the very least, to a certain minimum amount. And if you dip below that minimum you know, you're going to be trading off potential gains. So if you want to gain muscle, you have to eat a certain amount of protein, certain amount of carbs per day. And thus, by definition, due to caloric constraint, you know, you fill up with protein, fill up with carbs, then you only have so much left for fat. That amount left for fat is just not going to be that high. And so a lot of times you could ask a bodybuilder why he's not eating cheesecake and brownies. And you're like, it's carbs, right? They're like, oh, actually, their carbs are fine. It's just each cheesecake and brownie has so much fat in it that it doesn't leave a whole lot of room uh, for me to eat my protein and carbs, and thus I'll be under protein and under carbs if I choose to meet the calories. So it's a very specific, very uh, more rigid approach, right? For endurance sport, 
you have to have enough protein to prevent muscle loss, which is actually quite a bit. Um, and then you have to have a, an unbelievable amount of carbohydrate to supply and recover training. And thus, endurance athletes also eat relatively low-fat diets because, again, they just need to stuff in so much protein, and especially carbohydrate. Like a, a, a strength and body composition athlete might do this much protein and, and this much carb, whereas an endurance athlete might do a little bit less protein and that much carb, but still they reach sort of the same top end of just not many fats left over because you have to have protein and carbs is such an important job. And the sort of commonality there is that, like, look, like we need pretty specific amounts of these macronutrients in the end. Thus, macronutrient ratios and amounts are very important to people pursuing, pursuing body composition and performance. On the other hand, with health, uh, all you have to do is meet what are called health minima for these macronutrients. You have to have just enough protein to make sure your body attempts to repair and uh, upgrading of various structures that are made of protein. And that, that is just not a very high amount. Something like 10% of your calories per day from protein is probably enough for most regular folks that are just involved in regular exercise. And that's plenty enough protein if you don't want to get super jacked or something like that. Uh, how much carbohydrate do you need to attend to its various necessary functions? Well, it turns out carbohydrate is not even in the technical sense an essential nutrient, but it brings in uh, you know fiber along with it. And if you take carbohydrates in from sources like fruits, veggies, and whole grains, you have a lot of micronutrients that come in. But you can probably get all that stuff with as little as 10% of your daily calories coming from carbohydrate, especially if you get the right sources. And then the question of how much fat do you really need? Well, you know, the research is actually a little bit unclear on that, and some people actually speculate that you need almost no additional fat to be perfectly healthy. Uh, essential fats, if you look at the actual data of how much essential fat you need, because you can't make all the fats you need in your own body, you have to eat some of them. But it's uh, some estimates are to the tune of like, as little as one gram per day of essential fats for the average size person. One gram a day is not, you know, you'll get that just through eating normal food and just maybe having like a tiny bit of, you know, some kind of uh, special fat supplement, like a literal pill every day and you're golden, right? So, um, so that being the case, uh, we can see, so we can hypothesize that some extra fat intake on top of that is probably healthy from an optimality perspective. And we can say, look, you know, at, at very, very, if we're really being pushed, you don't need any more than 10% of your calories per day coming from fats, right? So we have 10, 10, 10, the remainder of 70% of your calories. Where the hell are they supposed to come from? Well, the answer is alcohol. <laughs> uh, so, which technically provides energy. But uh, so the, the question is where, so as long as we get the minimum amount of proteins and carbs and fats, where can we get the rest of our macronutrients? And for, for endurance performance and sport performance and muscle building, that's just clearly not the right answer. You need way more of those minima. For health, the answer is you can actually get them from any combination of proteins or carbs or fats or all three. So, for example, let me lay out some sample diets that work to nearly optimize health. All of these diets are nearly equivalent in their effect on health. A vegan diet that is intentionally low protein that is 10% protein per day and 10% fat and 80% carbohydrate. Okay? And there's actually like an over a specific literature review on vegans that uh, looked at a diet that was up to 80% 80, 80 of calories from carbs, and these people are as healthy as people can be. Then you can say, okay, I really want to eat protein. I want to be a carnivore or whatever. Uh, then you can eat 10% uh, of your uh, calories from, from, carbo from carbohydrates, like green veggies and something like that. You can eat 10% of your calories from fats. It'll probably come in ancillary to the meat sources you're eating. And eat literally 80% of your calories from protein. Like uh, Competition bodybuilders will occasionally dip into diets like this for months on end, weeks for sure, sometimes months, towards the tail end of body, bodybuilding prep for a show. And uh, interestingly enough, especially if you factor out the super hypocaloric conditions that they're in, uh, and if you test natural bodybuilders, because bodybuilders that use hormones are unhealthy for those reasons, but natural bodybuilders eating these kinds of diets have blood work that looks almost magical. We're talking about cholesterol so low we didn't even think that was possible. Uh, super low body fat, uh, just just super healthy all around. Um, and all of a sudden you say, okay, well, I thought high-protein diets were bad for health. Like Clearly they're just not. And then you can take the, the other polar approach. There's four total approaches you can take. right? The other polar approach is a high-fat diet. I mean, this used to be back in the 80s and 90s, and that's I mean, you would, just, you would be completely insane to suggest. But they actually did research on people who have high-fat diets who eat very few carbohydrates, just enough, just enough protein on that 10% each 
roughly, and then 80% of their calories come from fats. I mean, the good news is that's a whole lot of, of nut butter and, and uh, macadamia nuts, which are delicious. And the also good news is that, especially if you consume the right kinds of fats, which we can get into later in food composition, um, you can be unbelievably healthy consuming mostly fats, 80%. The last kind of diet you can have in this sort of general category of diet is what we call, call a mixed diet. Uh, is where you get roughly equivalent, roughly equivalent um, amounts of calories from all three of the nutrients. So you eat something like a third of your calories a day from protein, a third from carbs, a third from fats, or anywhere plus or minus 10% there uh, for each one of those, and then you're super healthy. And that's how most healthy people actually live, is a balanced diet. You know, sort of like the typical plate you see in a healthy eating magazine, like a little slab of salmon, some green, some brown rice, and a dab of avocado. Like, yeah, that's, that's super healthy. Hilariously, this is one of these sort of rhetorical devices I use when I, I'm trying to get students uh, or seminar attendees to sort of crink, critically think about diets and claims. You know, anytime you see like uh, people saying carbs are bad, carbs are going to kill you, like fats are bad, they're going to kill you, proteins are going to kill you, I ask them to think of this meal of salmon, brown rice, veggies, and a dab of avocado into into a straightforward tell me that they think this is an unhealthy meal at some fundamental level. And that's insane, right? It, it could be the fact that this is secretly killing us and we just don't know. But if you just, in your brain, look at the kind of people that eat meals that look like that, they're all super healthy. And, of course, when we do actual data analysis and you just you know research thousands of people, those are the, the healthiest people, right? Or among the healthiest people are people who eat food just like that. I mean, can you imagine coming up to someone at a Whole Foods and they have a meal that sort of looks like that and you're like, trying to kill yourself, huh? And they're like, what? <laughs> and you're like, look, that brown rice is toxic because it's made of insulin or whatever. And you're like, just get, just get the fuck out of my face, right? This is no, no, I don't have time for this, right? So that kind of diet is awesome, but then all those diets in between are awesome. So if someone just has salmon and avocado and greens on their plate, they're totally good to go. If they have mostly brown rice, a, a little bit of uh, uh, salmon uh, or just a vegan protein source and a tiny bit of avocado or even none, that's totally good to go. Or if they have like four slices of avocado, a little bit of like turkey bacon and a, a, you know almost no rice, just some greens, that's also a super healthy meal, right? So all of that stuff. So basically what we learn from that is so long as you're eating healthy foods, which we can get to whenever you'd like, um, a healthy diet really doesn't depend on the kind of macros you're taking in, right? So when I'm consulting someone or in, investigating someone and, and trying to figure out how their diet can be healthier, I'm not usually like, how much protein are you eating? Because if I'm consulting someone on body composition, if someone tells me they want to get jacked or they want to run more endurantly, I'm interested in how much protein and carbs they're eating. When someone wants to be healthy, I'm not so much interested in how much protein and carbs they're eating. I'm interested in where the, where the foods are coming from. So if you want, we can get into that at some point. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really empowering for folks because instead of getting pigeonholed into a specific type of diet, they can sort of cater more towards just their food preferences, focus on where those sources are coming from and uh, be healthful or be eating in a healthful way either way. Now, you touched on alcohol and that's sort of like the fourth macronutrient. So how would you fit or not fit alcohol into these three paradigms before we get to the food quality or food composition thing? Yeah, there seems to be some small benefit, potentially, of alcohol and some sorts of things. Um, it could be a benefit of alcohol to cardiovascular disease risk, although it's not really certain. Um, and certainly there could be a benefit to some alcoholic beverages, like uh, wines and beers, potentially, uh, specifically wines to cardiovascular health. But even that literature is not nearly as convincing as people would like you to believe. So alcohol uh, is probably okay in, in moderation, and moderation means not that much, one or two drinks a day. Um, as soon as you exceed that level, you're making a known trade-off between how much fun you want to have and how much health you want to have. And I'm, I'm not here to, you know, I weigh 240 pounds. I'm not here to tell people that the, the, that trade-off ne necessarily needs to be towards health. I'm also here to tell folks that sometimes the trade-off is necessarily between health or long-term uh, health and fun. You know, you can be a health nut your whole life and go to zero parties and do zero drugs and eat zero cheeseburgers, and uh, you can live a long time in your life. You may find it to be very fulfilling, but you may also find it to be not so fulfilling and wish you could have lived more fun. And there are people that drop dead at age 65, rock stars, for example. Let's take somebody, let's, let's make this sort of politically incorrect and take someone like Prince. You know, Prince did not die in old age, but... You know, are you going to tell me he didn't have a whole lot of fun when he was alive? Holy shit, he might have had more fun than any single human being, short of Mick Jagger or something. 
right? And it's sort of like kind of the rock star lifestyle almost personifies this idea that like, yeah, these guys don't live a long time, but holy shit, they live while they're alive, right? And if you tell them like, hey, you know, if you stop rocking till all the hours in the morning and did, didn't do cocaine, you would have a really fulfilling life. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe they're just not interested in that sort of thing, right? So it has to be an understanding of trade-offs and all of these things. But the alcohol trade-off is very clear. It's not like you can magically excuse yourself from having five or six beers a day and be like, oh, it's totally healthy. Like, it's not totally healthy. But it's not the end of the world. Uh, if you have 10 or 12 beers a day, it's close to the end of the world if you keep that up. Uh, but it's a sliding scale, you know, and, and the, the, the tipping point for, for sure gets worse is probably any, anything north of two, two to four drinks per day. Anything south of that is probably okay. And zero alcohol, is, if I would, I would have to guess zero alcohol is probably optimal. That's my best guess. I could be wrong. The answer could be one or two drinks, but it's certainly not any more than that, or almost certainly. So alcohol is a, is a known trade-off there. Yeah, and the tricky thing with booze to separate out is like, what are you typically doing when you're having a drink or two per day? You're probably socializing with friends, maybe laughing a bunch, telling stories. Maybe you're out at a restaurant with a nice meal, and it sort of really ties in with that social and community piece that's just impossible to separate out in the research. So it's a bit of a tricky one there. Yeah, totally. Yeah, people that um, have one or two drinks a day as a statistical group tend to be more social and tend to have more enjoyable experiences. Interestingly enough, there's been quite a bit of research on the fact that social connection is um, a longevity enhancer. It's really trippy. So, um, you know, people who live sort of curmudgeon lonely lives, they tend to expire quite, quite a bit more quickly. Interestingly enough, another piece of research, which is not as robust but still uh, very um, interesting, is that people who have very, very involved intellectual lives tend to live longer than people that don't. Um, if you look at the ages of death of many prominent scientists, uh, com- music composers, engineers, uh, people uh, who were involved in creative endeavors, uh, they tend to live a really long time for no goddamn good reason. And then you actually look at what they did, and they just stayed intellectually active the entire time that they were alive. And uh, people who are not as intellectually active seem to, for whatever reason, and I'm not sure if it's correlation or causation, uh, don't, just don't live as long. So, yeah, you know, basically, if you're trying to be the ultimate health nut, and that means you never go out with your friends because you don't drink, maybe you're not making the right uh, choice even for longevity and health. So there is something to consider. But if you go out and drink with your friends, one or two drinks is cool. Anything after that might be a whole lot more fun, but probably isn't the best for your long-term health. Yeah, and and Warren Buffett is one of those sort of one-off examples. Is like the dude eats like shit. He eats McDonald's every single day for breakfast, but he's incredibly sharp, very much intellectually active, and uh, I don't know. I think he's at least in his late eighties right now. Yeah, something. Yeah, he keeps. He was old in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally. So we touched on this a little bit, but uh, the food quality or food composition. What differs between the three categories when it comes to health, performance, body comp, and food composition? Interestingly enough, so food composition is the question of what the food is made of. We can envision a spectrum of food composition. Uh, of probably foods that include fewer micronutrients, less fiber, so less vitamins, less minerals, uh, less phytochemicals, which are sort of as yet not very well researched. Parts of plants usually, and there's probably some molecules like that in animal foods uh, that slightly enhance health, but there's a bunch of them, so maybe they add up to something significant. And then, of course, fiber is very, very health-enhancing. So you can look at foods, and at least on those judge every single food on the degree to which it has those uh, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and fiber, uh, and the degree to which it does not. Right? So if you get like a Twinkie uh, versus like an apple, a piece of avocado, like they probably have about the same amount of carbs and fats if you portion it properly, that the Twinkie has pretty much just the carbs and fats and the kinds of fats it has are not so great for your health. And the apple and avocado have like a zillion different nutrients. So just on those, food composition matters for everybody um, because you have to get at least a minimum of those nutrients. In addition to that, um, specifically fats can be separated into ones that are more health-promoting and less health-promoting. The least health-promoting kinds of fats are transaturated fatty acids. Uh, They're uh, not so great for your health, although they're really great for keeping food um, uh, palatable on shelves for a long time. 
Uh, and then saturated fats are sort of next, or they're they're okay to eat in moderation and even relatively high amounts. But if, even in a calorie constrained diet, if you eat too much saturated fat, you might be at independently slightly higher risk for a bunch of stuff, specifically cardiovascular disease. And then, so you know, things like you know slabs of cheese, a bunch of eggs, and bacon might not be the greatest diet, even if you're of a healthy weight. It's a small effect, but it's nonetheless an effect. And then polyunsaturated fats and most oils and so on and so forth are okay. And then probably the healthiest kinds of single fats are monounsaturated fats. And monounsaturated fats are things that you know occur highly in olive oil, canola oil, um, nuts, nut butters, avocados, so on and so forth. And I tell you, if you ever look into the research on monounsaturated fats and health, it really looks about as close to a magic elixir as you can get. Right? This is it. Uh, every time they overfeed people with olive oil, is people just don't gain weight and they lose fat and, and their blood lipids improve a crazy amount. And they're like, holy crap, like, this is amazing. Right? So it's, it's funny, too, because a couple of years ago there was a really big trend in the direction of coconut oil, which is largely saturated fat. People were like, it's amazing. And I was like, what do you think about olive oil? They're like, yeah, it's not as good as coconut oil. I'm like, have you ever seen the research on olive oil versus coconut oil? And they're like, no. I'm like, the number of articles of olive oil's health benefits are in the thousands. And the number in, of articles on the health benefits of coconut oil are in the several articles. And then when enough articles got published, it turns out coconut oil was, uh, if you overeat it, a net negative to health. It was kind of like, oops, that guy's got that one wrong, right? <laughs> so monounsaturated fats are really prized in the fats department um, and also have probably some advantages in muscle building um, and, and keeping body fat a little lower than you would expect, maybe through some inflammatory pathways or something like that. So, you know, and the fish oils sort of come in, in, into perspective there, like omega-3 fats versus omega-6 fats and some you know, other minor details. So if you take a look at all this together, and I guess we're throwing, you know, protein in there, um, protein needs to be uh, mostly complete sources or enough uh, complete proteins to give you all your amino acid needs. So if you get all your proteins from, like, uh, you know, a source that, like, for example, all of your protein comes from gluten from bread, uh, then you're just not getting enough protein no matter how much bread you're eating. Uh, and then, you know, if you get your protein from really high quality vegan sources like soy, for example, or meat sources, chicken, uh, fish, uh, beef, eggs, uh, milk, then you're getting really, really high quality protein. You just don't need much of it. Right? So that's kind of the, the lay of the land there. And now we can ask the question of, OK, so for body composition versus health, what is kind of the difference there of how much it affects your body composition as per slash performance and health? Uh, and as the first thing I'll say is this. Uh, for all of the insight we've gotten out of the literature and for all of the pain this causes nutritionists that are involved with sports teams on college campuses, food composition, where your proteins, carbs, and fats come from, makes a very small difference to performance and to body composition. So you don't have to eat tons of whole grains and super great protein sources and all the best fats to perform at a very high level. Now, to the extent that you eat more of those things, you can perform a little bit higher. In our analysis of the data at RP, when we write our, our books, we've concluded that for body composition and performance, the average yield out of 100% total effect of your diet for where your foods come from is probably about 5%. Now, that is in reference to timing. Timing is 10%. Macronutrients, protein, carb, fat ratios is 30%. And calories are 50%. Right? So basically, if someone ask the question of, hey, how much are you eating versus, hey, what are you eating? In sport, that question is an order of magnitude different in its, impo in its importance. It's 10 times more important how much you eat for sport versus what you're eating. So, for example, if you're a football offensive lineman and you're eating the healthiest foods but you're under eating, you're going to start to really suck at being an offensive lineman because you're going to lose so much weight that people are going to just push you around. But if you eat almost exclusively cheeseburgers and pizzas as an offensive lineman, but you eat enough of them to keep you at 150 kilos or whatever, then you're going to be pretty good at your sport. Now, if you cleaned up your diet, you'd be a little better, but not much. Sometimes that's such a little improvement that you can't really detect it, which is why many, many athletes, as you probably well know, don't eat nearly as healthy as you would expect. Right? You're like, how are, these, how are these people eating this junk food and doing these incredible things? Well, they eat enough junk food, right? Um, I and mean, if they don't, if they undereat, then they just fall apart. Or if they overeat, they're really, really bad, right? So... As a matter of fact, one time, one of my colleagues at uh, the PhD program, he's a 10,000-meter, 5,000, 10,000-meter runner, and I saw him eat an entire box of Ho-Hos in one sitting, just socializing. It was like a 12 pack or something. I was like, oh my God, this guy weighed like 150 pounds. And then, like, that's like, I don't know, 1,500 calories or something? But the thing is, is he had like clear abs. His blood work was excellent. 
And it was just that he just needed that much food to keep him alive. <laughs> and, you know, he would have to overeat junk food by such an obscene amount to gain so much weight that it made him poor at sport performance that you really couldn't levy the accusation that he would be that much better off with whole grains, so on and so forth. And interestingly enough, for endurance athletes, if you push whole grains, fruits and veggies too much on them, they end up eating so much fiber to try to get to their carb amounts that they will have digestive difficulties. To put it, blunt, to put it bluntly, they will shit themselves uh, all the time to a considerable amount. So you actually need some processed carbs for them in order for them to just get enough food, right? Um, so that's the thing with body composition of sport. Now, again, it does enhance your performance and body composition if you pay a good deal of attention. So you still want to eat mostly healthy foods, but it's going to be a smaller difference. It's going to be an optimal but it's going to be a smaller difference between if you get optimum healthy foods versus just total junk. The difference is not as big as we would think. On the other hand, in our estimate, um, calories are 60% of the importance for health, even more than they are for performance. But food composition is, instead of 5% that it is for performance and body composition, it is 20% of the importance for health. That's a big deal. It's actually the next biggest thing. Whereas macronutrients, uh, I believe, are 10% of the importance. So, uh, you know, they're just not that important. Uh, again, as, as I described earlier, if someone's like, hey, are you getting enough protein? Yeah, you probably are for health, right? So it's just not that important because these are huge ranges where you can. But food composition is more important. So if you look at someone's plate and they're an athlete and you just look at the kinds of food they're eating – you could be like, you know, oh, you should be eating healthier, but, mm, you know, that's nice. It might make an impact on their performance. It won't be much. But if someone is gearing for health and they have the right macros together and they have the right calories together, but they're eating Twinkies and cheeseburgers, mm, you can criticize what their plate looks like. And you can say, look, if you eat more salmon, brown rice, et cetera, you probably will be healthier. But to put that in perspective, it, the most important thing is getting enough of the nutrients that you need and sticking within calorie constraints. So if you eat most of your foods, maybe 70, 75% of your food from healthy sources, I can describe those quite easily, uh, complete lean proteins, veggies, fruits, whole grains, probably in that order, eating tons of veggies, some fruits, and uh, a more limited amount of whole grains, because each one of those has decreasing amounts of micronutrients in it. And then healthy fats, mostly from monounsaturated sources, making sure to get enough omega-3 fats and essential fats. Uh, those kinds of uh, foods should compose 70 to 75 percent at least of your diet if you want optimal health. But the remaining roughly 25 percent can come from all kinds of junk food, and it's probably going to keep you just as healthy. So there's this this really really sharp curve of diminishing returns from eating healthy north of you know 70 to 80 percent of your diet. So for example, if you follow someone around for a day. And they eat mostly just real good stuff. And then they have a couple of ice cream cones at the end of their day. And you know that that's in the context of total calories, that they don't gain weight from that. They're going to be pretty much just as healthy as someone who eats only healthy food all day long. On the flip side, if you see someone eating ice cream cones, they look like they're at a healthy weight. They look pretty lean. You can't automatically jump down their throat for killing themselves with ice cream if you don't know what else they ate that day or, so to speak, on a typical day. Right. Whereas, you know, uh, some people would be really tempted to, to want to separate into good and bad foods. It turns out that, you know, it's a really hard case to make that any foods that are junky, uh, you know, uh, are really bad sort of on their own. They're almost always bad if you displace most of your healthy foods with them, first of all. And more particularly, that, 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 that eliminates that 20 percent of benefit, which is bad. But then the worst way that junky foods uh, degrade your health is to go into that calorie 60% and start chopping that off because you're over on calories. Right? Uh, one of the biggest ways in which food is unhealthy is you consume so much of it that you uh, exceed your healthy weight. And that's what really gets you in trouble. So when people say oh, Twinkies are bad for your health, if you eat most of your food from healthy sources, you have a Twinkie here and there, they're actually just not bad for your health. It's the clear, clearest way I could state it. But if you eat Twinkies on top of a healthy diet and you eat one too many of them and you start gaining weight, Twinkies are bad for your health. But if you ate brown rice and chicken on top of your healthy diet, which is just really difficult to do, and you gain fat like that, that would also be really bad for your health. So yes, Twinkies by themselves are not great for your health, but so long as most of your food is from healthy sources, it's really not that big of a deal. 
Yeah, that's a cool breakdown because I think it puts into context that order of importance and not violating the bigger chunks of the principles. Now, next up, we've got timing. So in other words, when we eat and then how many meals per day we eat, what are the different considerations between our three three goals on meal timing and meal frequency? Yeah. So for performance, it's important to eat, uh, to be sufficiently fueled before training and sufficiently recovered with food after training. And uh, also to supply your body with a constant amount of protein it needs to keep your uh, structures being rebuilt uh, from the hard training. So it's possible for performance to eat just a few meals a day if you train once a day. Probably should eat before training. Should probably eat a lot after training. when you can eat you know, another meal later just to keep hunger at bay and get enough calories. Uh, if you train twice a day, you're already up to a, sort of at least four meals per day because then you'll just be missing some of those windows. If you're interested in body composition, it seems that in order to supply muscle-growing nutrients, you need to eat protein multiple times throughout the day. In order to stave off muscle breakdown, you need to also eat protein multiple times throughout the day. Probably good idea to eat carbs pre-training to fuel best training, carbs post-training to fuel to begin anabolism and to fuel recovery. So four to seven meals per day, or we could say at least four, but any more than seven probably doesn't do you any more good, is a number of meals ref- relatively evenly spread that you need. Uh, and also just making sure you have carbohydrates with your food, pre-training and post-training is probably ideal for body composition, definitely for performance. Um, for health, uh, you know, it really the uh, nutrient timing for health, I think we ranked at 5%. Uh, of importance, whereas for body composition, it's 10%. Because, you know, they have done a lot of research on diets all the way from eating like eight times per day, you know, the grazing thing, which like in the 90s and early 2000s was a big deal, like you were supposed to graze. And if someone saw you, this is funny how culture works. If in the late 90s, someone, you know, you like basically the ultimate test in life is you're out with other successful business professionals and they judge the kind of food you're ordering and they they judge your worthwhile character as a human being. So, um, you know, if you had ordered a lot of food, you sat down and ate a lot of food, um, people would be like, oh, I thought it was unhealthy to eat big meals, right? Like that's, you know, like there's that sentiment still with many people that exist, but definitely back in the day was like, oh, this is clearly just an irresponsible person. You know what I mean? Like a glutton. Um, it, it turns out that, you know, they put that to the test and they, they've tested diets that are as extreme as what's called alternate day fasting, which literally means you don't eat food one day and then you eat a whole lot of food the next day and you repeat. So far as I can tell from our analysis of the research, which was done last two years ago, but there was already a ton of research out there. And, you know, the more research that builds, the less likely it is to change the, the, the average uh, insight. Um, and I've stayed in touch with the literature since then and I've seen no major shifts. To the extent that I'm aware, if you told me six meals a day is healthier than alternate day fasting, you to a, 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 an intelligent layperson who can read scientific studies would have a very hard time convincing them of that fact just based on the research. I would like to believe that that's true because I'm a bodybuilder and I eat six times a day, but it's just probably not, right? And if it is true, it's maybe by the smallest of margins. So for example, if alternate day fasting means that your activity levels on the days you're not training are super duper low and that's unhealthy, that's an argument for eating enough meals just to stay active. Another one is, you know, you're at work and you still expected to work, right? Your boss isn't going to be like, hey, you get those reports done and you're like, boss, I'm not eating today, so I'm not doing anything at work. You're like, what? <laughs> like, you know, your brain doesn't work all that well when you don't eat, right? So if you eat food just to keep you working, uh, that, then that's there may be a limit on how much fasting can help in that case, right? But some people don't seem to need a whole lot of food, and they at least fast for a first half of the day and feel quite energized, especially with some coffee. So there's a, some leeway there. So it ends up being that when we ask the question of for health, what is the optimal meal number and frequency? The answer is, you know, if over the course of several days you meet your calorie needs, you're probably within the clear of general approaches. And then if you want to get more specific, like if you find that you have the energy for daily tasks, whatever meal frequency gives you that is good enough. Some people can eat two meals a day and kick, kick ass. 
some people, and you maybe know some people like this personally, they just, they're kind of like a machine. They kind of buzz on just always eating, right? Like, there's people that skip a meal and they just go oh, hypoglycemic immediately. And they're like, I need food. Otherwise I cannot function. And there's totally people like that. So we got to be careful going one way or the other. Cause sometimes people say, well, alternate daily fasting has some unique health benefits. It really actually does. The problem is it has some unique health downsides as well. And it really comes down to the individual. So if you do alternate day fasting or intermittent fasting where you eat for only a small part of the day, if it works for you, if you can have high energy, you can be productive at work, you can still train pretty hard or like, you know, get your normal daily exercise, totally good from a health perspective. But if you feel like you need or if you've experimented and you really just need to eat sort of more around the clock, at least every three or four hours or five hours, then that's totally cool. Um, so there's this big open window just like there is with uh, macronutrients for health. Like you can eat a whole bunch of protein, carbs, fats, whatever, as long as you meet your minima. As long as you're eating enough to supply your daily energy levels and you feel good, uh, meal frequency probably has no big, uh, certainly has no big effect on health and may, may have no effect on health whatsoever. Yeah, so sort yeah. of the trend that we're seeing is like there's a lot more room to fit your daily preferences and priorities within the health paradigm and the performance and body composition. There's a little bit less room. You have to be more on top of things there. But lastly, we've got supplements. So are there, are there any supplements that you'd recommend to folks looking to optimize their health, body comp, or performance? So none of them are mandatory, but some of them can be helpful. If you're trying to pack on muscle and enhance performance, creatine is probably a good idea. Monohydrate is probably the only one that works for sure. And it's super cheap, super easy to take. Um, you can fuel your training better if you have long training sessions with glycemic carbohydrate supplements. Endurance athletes are useless without them. So, you know, you bring Gatorade on the bike or even more concentrated gels and things like that. Um, whey protein is great for workouts, uh, post-workout window, intra-workout nutrition for people interested in advanced muscle growth and recovery during training. Casein protein is a cool option to take at night because it sort of feeds your muscles while you sleep. But you can get it from milk and yogurt and all this other stuff. Uh, a multivitamin every day is probably good for everybody, uh, just to make sure you're rounding out your intake and make sure, like, you know, have some off days here where you're not eating a variety of foods, and that's just good uh, good practice, no downside. And then uh, fish oil, uh, omega-3 supplements might have some advantages for performance, but they're probably minor and not worth the benefit. And then uh, caffeine uh, and other stimulants are pretty cool for performance enhancement. They have to be used intelligently, make sure they don't interfere with sleep, so on and so forth, cycled appropriately. But for performance enhancement, caffeine can be a really good effective supplement. And as far as health is concerned, multivitamin is a good thing to have. And then there are, you know, maybe fish oil, depending on the literature you look. It's not nearly as promising as people once thought. Or it was basically omega-3, DHA, EPA supplements. And then after that, uh, the supplements become very population-specific. So, like, uh, for example, pregnant women may need a supplement. Um, vegans may need a supplement with some very specific supplements that aren't just 5% of the effect. They're pretty meaningful. But other than that, supplements for health are really just kind of a misnomer out of the get-go. And hilariously, there are sort of my least favorite kind of store is a health food store that is mostly supplements. Whereas like, you know, if I get a supplement store that's mostly for people looking to enhance their performance or body composition, you get protein bars, you get protein, creatine, all this cool stuff, shakes. Um, that actually does stuff. It doesn't do a lot, but it does something. When you know you've ever been to a, a health supplement store, you're from where are you from? Vancouver. Yeah. So I guarantee you've seen these things. Uh, you get into the store and you're like, I need protein. And they're like, we don't carry a whole lot of protein because it's bad for your gut or whatever. And you're like, okay. And you look at stuff and it's just a bunch of different herbs and vitamins and stuff and like usually individually packed. You're like, really, someone needs this much B12? Like, okay. So. Uh, and basically, being as, uh, as politically correct as it can be, most of the stuff on those shelves is is just not necessary for health in the slightest. Some very specific populations may benefit, and that's up to you and your nutritionist to decide. That if you think, like if you're a healthy person, you basically want all those salmon, avocado, brown rice people. Then right? you're walking down the street, and you see health food supplement store, and you walk in, and you look at all the stuff, and you're like, oh my god, like, should I be taking all this stuff? Like, this is, you know, like, am I missing something? The answer is you're absolutely not missing anything. If you spend too much time at a store like that and spend your money, you're probably just wasting a whole lot of money. Totally. I mean, the, the health food store is the grocery store. So um, exactly. before, before we get to where folks can find more of your work, Mike, is there anything that we didn't get to today that you think is worth mentioning? Or is there anything that you'd like to leave the listeners with? I would love to leave the listeners with the idea that sticking to the core basics and eating mostly healthy foods and having a little bit of junk here and there is the surest and most easy, most straightforward path to health. 
was the most uh, likely to guarantee your health. And that any time you look at some kind of claim that says you need to drink this supplement, this herbal tea, or the way to enhance your health is to eliminate vast swaths of your typical foods and diets, that some foods are poisonous. Um, for example, people, uh, you know, we're talking about whole grains have anti-nutrients, like things that prevent the absorption of vitamins and minerals. The thing is, almost nobody in the United States is vitamin or mineral deficient in any way that would be concerning. So it's kind of like, okay, okay. That's nice if you exclusively subsist on whole grain bread and you live in East Africa and you're starving to death. Yes, that's the thing. But other than that, it's just not a thing. So people get on these buzzwords and catchphrases, usually from people trying to push an ideology or make money or both. And then they start to think like, oh, God, like what? I've been lied to. You know, my normal healthy diet, uh, you know, the, the whole salmon plate thing, that just, geez, that's just wrong. If you're so tempted to go down that route, just remember the fact that most of that is total BS. So uh, don't worry about it and just stick to the basics and you'll be okay. Uh, and a lot of people are going to do these other crazy diets and buy these supplements and they're going to be wrong. And if you ask the question, can that many people be wrong? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, there's a very well-documented phenomena of mass delusions and the insanity of crowds. People subscribe to all kinds of crazy ideas. Uh, you know, Whatever political party you think is the right one, just look at how many people vote for the other one. It doesn't even matter what the right answer is. Clearly, some of us are way wrong and some of us are way right and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, because a lot of times, and the reason I point this out is people will hear so much about a product that they'll, they'll have this idea like, well, gee, but there's got to be something to it, right? Like, for example, CBD oil. Like, it's our estimate that CBD oil probably does a whole lot of mostly nothing. And some of the effects it has are probably just really small beneficial effects. So it's cool to take it, but you don't have to. Like, they're remotely... But how many, I don't know what, what it's like in Canada, but how many advertisements for CBD oil do you typically see? How many podcasts? I mean, it's just like a wave of CBD oil. And so most folks who aren't experts in nutrition can be like, you know, they hear about it at work. They hear, Joe Rogan talks about it. Uh, they look at, new, you know, they're scrolling on Facebook and there's posts about it. There's ads about it. There's a, a new sign outside of their house in their neighborhood, like CBD center, distribution center. And they're going to be like, you know, well, gee, CBD's got to have something behind it, and the answer is it probably has almost nothing behind it. And that's crazy, but it's just, it bears repeating that people will do all kinds of crazy stuff, and different generations have different crazy stuff. And in the 90s, if you ate saturated fat, you were just trying to commit suicide as far as people were concerned. And in the 2000s, if you weren't stuffing avocados down your face, you were reckless, and so on and so forth. Don't fall for the fat, stick to the base. I love that. That's a great way to round things out. Now, Mike, if folks want to learn more about you, your social handles, all that good stuff, where can they find you? Super. Um, at RP Strength is a Renaissance Periodization. is a company that I'm a co-founder of. We have all these books and articles and videos and free materials, and we have a diet app that if you don't want to buy that with the stuff, you just buy the app, and you first two weeks are free, and then it's just 15 bucks a month, and it designs an entire diet for you, updates it to whatever you want, and coaches you through it, all AI-powered, so you don't have to think anymore. Um, and uh, we do stuff like that, so that's cool. And then at RP Dr. Mike on Instagram. Uh, is where I can be followed for some cool tips and tricks every now and again, mostly half naked pictures of myself. Um, <laughs> and then Mike is on Facebook and Renaissance Periodization on the old regular internet where there's like tumbleweeds coming by and nobody goes to anymore. It's all Web 2.0. So uh, that's the deal. Yeah. And uh, hopefully folks can, uh, you know, get a little bit more informed and relax a little bit about thinking they need the next craze to keep them healthier performing. Absolutely, man. I'll link to all that stuff in the show notes. And I just want to thank you again. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much for having me. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Dr. Mike Isretel. As you can see, Mike's a pretty funny dude as well. So he makes the information, like I said at the beginning of the episode, super clear and concise, but then also entertaining, which always adds to the value. So like I mentioned at the outside of the show, if you're interested in personalized one-on-one -on -one nutritional coaching or workout programming... You can check out the website at n1fitness.com forward slash coaching, which is linked below, and you can book a consultation with me. You can also follow me on Instagram at n1fitness, and feel free to friend me up at Marcus Sidhu on Facebook as well. Thanks so much for listening, and I will catch you guys on the next episode. See ya.